Right. Well, um, I'm here today to talk to you about a uh, thing called Argo, which is a new introduction into the latest version of Zen, Zen 4.12. And uh, I just want to give you a, a talk through uh, what, what Argo is, um, where it came from, um, what the key properties of it are, um, its relationship to the hypervisors, uh, and then a bit on the details, uh, and then some references. So Argo is uh, an interdomain uh, communication transport. It is a means of uh, transferring data between VMs running on the same host. Um, and it was developed originally for uh, Zen client. It's been around for an extended period of time. Uh, it, was, it was known as V4V um, when it came into into creation, um, and subsequently V4V has you know been developed and extended and is incorporated in Bromium's vCentry uh, product and is deployed on uh, millions of machines. Um, whereas Argo has been uh, you know produced uh, derived both from V4V. Uh, the original technology from Zen Client and the, uh, with some input from the Bromium extensions, but it is now its, its own thing incorporated into Zen. Um, and in a nutshell, the, the one line description of it is that it is a hypervisor mediated data copies from one VM to another. And, and the reason for this structure is because it prioritizes isolation between your VMs. Uh, the ability to enforce access control policies on your data connections and ensuring that there is conformance to the transfer protocol that the receiver can um, trust that the way that the message is delivered complies with with expectations um, and it is a simple but powerful primitive that you can build uh, more capable uh, levels of software upon um, and as I mentioned, it's, uh, it's included in Zen 4.12. You, you uh, set a kconfig option to turn it on um, into your build, and then there's a Zen command line option that you provide that tells the uh, subsystem uh, to come live when you boot. So Ar Argo is actually uh, the longest patch up streaming in Zen's history ever. Um, taking eight years as, as, as far as I'm able to tell. So this is, this is the timeline, what it looks like. Uh, Zen Client starts in 2010, um, and you know, V4V, v, the original version, was developed in support of this software to meet the requirements of um, not wanting the network SAC to be necessarily involved in your inter-VM communication. 2011 is when, when I think the clock starts. That's when Ross reserved hypercall number 39 in Zen. Um, Jean produced a patch series, uh, several iterations of the patch series of V4V submitted to Zendevel. You can find it in the archives. It's good, interesting reading. A lot of input from a lot of people. Um, Phil prepared a presentation at the 2013 Zen Summit. Uh, Ross picked up from where Jean handed over with another round of patch series. Uh, 2014, the OpenXT project begins. It's sort of Zen Client's body of code is now open to the world public. Uh, I gave a presentation in, in 2016, mentioning that we would quite like this patch series to go in. Um, in 2017, Bromium's uh, hypervisor is, is uh, shipped on HP laptops, so this software actually gets deployed to millions of machines that don't even necessarily know that this is the foundation of it. Um, and then in 2018, uh, I posted the uh, Argo patch series at the end of the year and through the early stages of 2019. Eight rounds of reviews and uh, an iteration there and finally uh, is uh, been accepted into Zen. And it doesn't stop there. Uh, we're still working on the next aspects of, of Argo's development and capabilities. Um, so there's, and there's a couple of uh, related things with, with Windows. Uh, so Windows has had a similar capability uh, at least since 2006. I'll touch on that in a bit. Um, and uh, the modifications to the QMU machine type are, are kind of a uh, of similar interest to, to this. So um, Argo, it is one hypercall 
as far as Zen is concerned, uh, with four basic operations. Uh, you register ring, uh, unregister ring. That's where um, a, I'll, I'll talk through this a bit later, but basically the, if you're wanting to establish the ability to communicate, you reserve a region of memory and you let the hypervisor know. And then there's these two other hypercalls to actually, hypercall operations to, to operate it. So the, the key properties for, for Argo, and these are so important that that's why we have persisted in uh, attempting to get this uh, technology accepted into Zen because nothing else uh, will do. Um, th these, these are properties that you know, will continue to be maintained in future iterations of Argo. So there's, there's no memory shared between guest VMs that are communicating. Right, it's, it really is the hypervisor that performs the, the data transfer between your two communicating endpoints. Um, the data is copied. It's, there's no, again, there's no shared memory, but it, there, it is actually a, a, a copy operation in order to maintain spatial isolation uh, between your guests. Um, as I said, it's the, it's the hypervisor that performs the data copy. Um, and, and since the hypervisor is performing the copy, it, it's trusted to adhere to the, the, the transfer protocol, the, the, the write into the guest, you know, will, will take into account ring indexes and behave as you expect it to. Um, because you can trust that it's, it's the hypervisor that's doing it. It's, it's not, you're not dependent on the remote endpoint to, to play nice. And, and that's a contrast to, for example, the, the grant tables, if you were to use those. Anyway, so th those, are, those are the key properties that make it distinctive and, and we will be preserved. Um, and part of the reason that we care about those properties is, uh, is, is due to um, this set of principles um, that are a foundation for uh, resilient, secure systems. There's a body of um, research and work on what what you look for in the structure of a system to enable you to build it into a, uh, a, th a thing that remains secure. Um, and so th this set was published in 2005. Um, data isolation, uh, control of information flow, uh, temporal separation so that if there's any sharing of resources, you ensure that you know, the resource is cleaned before the, the next tenant gains access to it. Uh, and, and fault isolation because you don't want uh, cascading faults to be able to, w w failure of one subsystem to uh, degrade uh, another that's meant to be isolated from it. So Argo, uh, v for v before it, was uh, built with these things in mind. Um, and so the objective is to provide a, a strong foundation for uh, communication. Uh, there's no shared memory, it does not require the grant tables, it does not require Zen store, uh, and you know, by removing the requirements on those things, you can build things that you otherwise would not be able to. Um, so, in order to create some kind of abstraction to say, um, uh, what a, there's this kind of a, a, a Rather than talking about the specifics of Argo, the more, the more general case of what, what is it about Argo that's different, and is this uh, difference presence in primitives provided by other hypervisors? Um, I was trying to distill um, what it is that is different and distinctive and that you need to look for when you're evaluating, can I do the same thing elsewhere? Um, so th this hypervisor-mediated data exchange is the term we use to describe uh, asynchronous authenticated message passing um, with, with no shared memory and, and able to enforce the um, adherence to the, the, the data exchange protocol. So um, this diagram might help make that concept a bit easier to follow. Um, but what, what I'm really looking for here is um, that in order to get data from the sender to the receiver, it, it's the hypervisor that performs the, the transfer from one partition to another, um, so that the uh, conformance to the ring protocol 
uh, can be trusted because it's the hypervisor, the trusted entity that performs it. And in addition to the data being received at the receiver, there's metadata uh, with it indicating context about it so that the, the hypervisor provides assurance that that data originated from this VM. So there's, there's an identifier and there's also you know, a size indicator that you can trust because uh, the hypervisor will tell you how much data it moved. Um, so covering uh, the existing uh, interpartition communication, if we, if we look at what's in Zen uh, prior to Argo, um, you're using the grant tables and, and, and the event mechanism. So grants are, are typically used to establish shared memory regions. Uh, there are grant primitives uh, that can do a data copy from one VM to another. Um, but as the receiver, um, you, you don't have any guarantee that the data copy that was um, requested was going to was was going to um, adhere to the the ring protocol. You you are um, yeah, there is there is less context provided with the data that is copied. Um, I'll come I'll come back to the uh, the additional context a little bit later. Um, Another aspect of what we're talking about grants is that um, the grant table code has accumulated quite a lot of uh, cruft uh, over the time that it has been in use. Right, there, it, it was written uh, by me originally, um, and as the Zen community learned more about you know, performance or, or the types of primitives that would be wanted in order to support the PV drivers. Different uh, sub-operations were added, um, and it's quite an extended uh, set of operations in the grant table code, some of which are not in use by modern PV drivers. Um, there's also, two, at least on Intel platforms, two different uh, APIs to the grant tables, which you can, I guess, can switch between them at runtime. Um, and it changes the, you know, the, the layout of the shared memory region. Um, it's really not necessarily a, a good idea. Um, and the grant tables uh, in a paper published a couple of years ago uh, were uh, attributed for 5%, being responsible for 5% of Zen's XSAs, CVEs. And the most recent of those was actually yesterday. Um, so anyway, uh, in, in OpenXT, we apply a couple of patches to kconfig your grant table implementation down and I would recommend those to uh, anyone else who has an interest. Um, okay, so um, Hyper-V's interpartition communication. Hyper-V uh, does have a method of sending data from one partition to another uh, that is conforms to that HMX uh, structure. Um, it has been there, it was documented in uh, WinHEC presentation 2006. It's in the um, hypervisor specification document from uh, Microsoft that you can find on GitHub. Um, but, and again, it has a slightly different structure to Argo uh, in that there is a copy into a private hypervisor region of memory and then a secondary copy into the, the receiver. Um, but it is, it is still the hypervisor that's performing that, that final delivery. Um, and then, and then Uzen. So Uzen is a uh, open source Type Two hypervisor um, uh, published by, developed by Bromium, um, uh, that uses V for V, uh, which you know is the you can trace its lineage back to Zen client. Uh, and, and since it's open source, you know I studied the uh, V for V implementation, studied the OpenXT V for V implementation in order to construct what Argo became. Anyway. Uh, V4V uh, has no, uh, sorry, Uzen has no legacy PV interfaces. They're, they're in this uh, platform, uh, guests use V4V to, in support of the PV devices. So there's no grant tables, there's no Zen store. Uh, it's all built on this simple data copying primitive. Uh, and this, this demonstrates that you, you, you can uh, get away from Zen's problematic uh, legacy interfaces in a, with using an approach built on, built on uh, Argo. Uh, and yes, Argo being derived from V for V uh, is also HMX compliant. 
So to, to walk through the uh, operations that Argo implements, uh, the, the first one, ring registration, this is uh, where if you have a, um, uh, you, you want to start a service that can have uh, other VMs connect to you, you, you register a ring of memory uh, with the hypervisor, with this, this hypercall op, and you specify um, either I want to receive messages from this other particular domain, or you can say I'm, I'm willing to receive messages from, from anyone. Um, there, when, when you make this hypercall operation, XSM is checked to make sure that you're allowed to register a ring or you're allowed to register an any sender ring. Uh, and if it passes, then that ring's registered and it creates a mapping in the hypervisor address space so that uh, no matter which uh, VM is, is, is scheduled, you know, the hypervisor can still perform the writes into the ring uh, and keep it nice and fast. Uh, unregistered ring, uh, again, uh, when your VM decides I'm done with it, you can say I don't want to be receiving any more messages and it's uh, the hypervisor state's purged and uh, you won't receive any more data in that ring. Uh, the send V is a uh, synchronous uh, operation, uh, the guest uh, sending data indicates the destination ring that you want to send to, so you, you identify the, the domain and the, uh, the port uh, and you provide uh, access to the data that you want to be sent. Uh, again, there's an XSM access control check, there's a space check to see is there, is there data that will, f you know, will my data fit? And if it does, there's a synchronous copy into the destination. If it doesn't fit, the hypervisor makes a note of, ah, okay, this guy wants to send uh, data there. I will give that guy a nudge when that level of space uh, becomes available. Uh, so there's the, the, the fourth call is, is notify. This, this is for where uh, a, uh, a VM can query um, uh, a ring, a receiver ring in, in another guest to say, uh, is there space in there? Um, there is an access control check. You're only allowed to query rings that you would actually be allowed to send to, um, and you'll get back a state indicator, you know, um, saying either you've requested, you know, too much uh, space, the ring's not that big, or yes, it's going to be fine, or there's too many people talking to this ring right now, you should come back uh, when things are quieter. Um, and again, the hypervisor will register interest. Uh, if, you have, if you've said, I want to send a large amount of data, it's not available, um, you'll get a nudge uh, IRQ later on um, when there is space available. And that, that's it. It's, it's not a very complicated set of operations, but it, it does enable uh, a different structure in, in your guess. Um, it has uh, full XSM flask control over whether or not you're allowed to access Argo at all, whether you're allowed to register rings, and if so, uh, whether it's to a speci specific endpoint, uh, or whether you're allowed to register these sort of wildcard receiver rings. Uh, and similarly, there's a check on send, just to make sure that uh, you have permission. Um, so these are the use cases we have for, for Argo in, in OpenXT at the moment. Um, it enables, basically, uh, a seamless replacement of network transport between VMs. So uh, anywhere where you think I want to send you know, a, a data stream between VMs, Argo is a viable use case. Um, so we, we, we export the user interface from the control domain to the actual UI renderer domain. All of that data goes over an Argo socket. Um, yeah. A series of different use cases. Uh, the last one, uh, debugging support, is, is, is really handy. You can have an SSH terminal, uh, you can establish a connection to the uh, remote VM if it's got the service listening, and you've got interactive access to the other VMs on your system. This is what it looks like to, uh, to do exactly that SSH use case. So um, in, in, in the VM where you've got your uh, server, uh, you load the kernel module, uh, which knows how to talk the hypercalls to the hypervisor. Uh, you export this environment variable, which is then um, toggles the behavior inside this uh, user space library. It's a preload library that enables you to run an unmodified SSHD uh, binary, and it translates all the, uh, the network access into Argo access. So, um, and it'll just sit and listen on the, uh, on the port specified. And then in your 
in your VMware, you've got your clients, you do a very similar thing, you load the kernel module, you tell it uh, in the environment, I'm going to be using Argo Transport, uh, and you use an unmodified SSH client binary uh, to the address. The address gets translated into the domain ID uh, of the, the VM you're actually trying to SSH to, um, and, and the connection gets established. And then, yeah, if you do this, you're basically typing at a regular terminal. You, same as if you SSH across the network. Um, this is kind of what that looks like as far as components. You've got your SSH server process doing system calls to the Linux Argo device. Uh, the kernel driver is then issuing hyper calls uh, um, and uh, invoking the hypervisor. Uh, any nudges that come back for, you know, hey, you've got an event uh, or, or there's data waiting for you come through the VRQ. Um, and so at the point, yeah, rings are registered here. So the, the, the Linux kernel driver will register a ring for memory. The client on the other side, you know, uh, when it, it will, will, will connect. And another ring, if, you, if you're following the typical um, socket, you know, uh, accept, um, spawn another ring. It's, it's a private point-to-point -point ring uh, at that point. So the, the, the any sender ring is used, you know, to accept incoming connections and, uh, the the point-to-point -point ring is used for the, uh, the, the the transport from once the accept call is. So your libargo then replaces that socket with PCI calls. Is that what's happening? That is what's happening. Yeah. Yeah. So your, your all your socket invocations work. The the this interposer library. You, there is an uh, uh, if you actually want to code directly against the Argo interface, you can. Yeah. Uh, it's just the interposer library makes it convenient because you don't actually have to change your existing binary. Yeah. That's right. Um, okay, so th this is this is basically just a, a specialization of the of the diagram I showed earlier on about HMX. Um, when when you actually have, you know, Argo working this way, uh, it is it's the hypervisor performing these these data copies into the the registered ring buffer. So um, that's Argo. Up to this point, um, the, the focus uh, until Q1 this year was really getting uh, the existing implementation into Zen at last, um, but it's not where we want to stop. There's a series of ex uh, additional extensions to Argo that we have um, been working on the design for, uh, and I can walk you through some of this. Um, the sender domain context, this is about uh, providing extra metadata in that header, so when the message arrives in the destination, you actually get um, the XSM security identifier of the domain that sent it to you, so that you can uh, reason about where this thing really came from. This is basically enabling uh, reasoning about XSM policy inside your guest, and if you, if you take that further and you uh, match your XSM policy with your SE Linux policy at either end, uh, you can start to uh, reason, reason about um, which which process at the other endpoint is talking to which process on the receive point, and start to enforce stronger policy controls. Um, so that's this is this is the uh, hypervisor plumbing to to put that in. So the the, the next step is um, at the moment Argo uh, implements um, unidirectional uh, transport, but in order to uh, apply narrower policy controls over uh, the replies to that. You you want to be able to track con connection state inside the inside the hypervisor. It's um, so we've got a we've got a prototype of that. Um, it, it's it's just adding a bit more state to ensure that um, replies um, go to the uh, same place that the original message came from. Uh, so yeah, building on the, these two things. Uh, we're looking to um, extend the, uh, make, make a richer access control um, uh, implementation and set of tools for managing a, a firewall. There's a very basic implementation if you need one now in OpenXT, um, but this will be a lot more um, powerful with these additional two things implemented first. Uh, the, the fourth thing is um, enabling Argo to uh, establish communication between VMs at different levels of nesting. Um, 
So the, the structure of Argo is actually a, a very good fit for um, communication between different nesting levels. Since you're invoking the hypervisor, um, uh, it, 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 it just needs some um, uh, work done on, on how exactly do you name the other endpoint that you want to talk to. Uh, and, and again, there's going to be need to be some uh, policy enforcement uh, that makes sense for that. Um, fifth thing, wildcard rings, protection of client, uh, client forward progress. This, this is sort of a, a, a more of a, a cleaning up item of a, at the, at the moment with Argo, you can register a ring uh, and say, I'm, I'm going to allow any domain to send to this ring. Um, now, the issue with that is uh, you, you don't want a noisy guest to be able to deny access to other VMs to that ring. You want some means of uh, enabling anybody who wants to uh, communicate on that ring to make some forward progress. Um, so that's one of the reasons why, at the moment in the current Argo implementation, there's two sets of policy controls. There's one for point-to-point -point rings, which are safe from that, and there's an additional policy control over who can register um, any sender rings just to make sure that you really do know what you're doing um, before doing that. Uh, the, the last thing is uh, I'd like to implement, uh, call, uh, term, using the term shutter rings, this is basically when you register a ring with Argo at the moment, uh, it adds uh, that ring to the hypervisor address space. So it doesn't matter which other guest is, is scheduled at the time, right? you can still uh, make the hypercall send operation and get that data into the ring. Uh, it's nice and efficient. However, leaving your rings mapped at all times isn't necessarily uh, what everybody wants if they're concerned about speculative execution, the ability to read memory. Um, so this is just a policy control for saying, actually, for this ring, uh, I'd like it to be mapped and unmapped only when it's actually uh, in use um, as a uh, confidentiality improvement. Um, a few research items uh, I'd like to do. Um, first one is looking at some accelerated transport options. There's, there's features of modern Intel hardware it would be nice to be able to take advantage of, um, perhaps in order to gain a bit more um, throughput. It, it's, it's moving away from necessarily relying on the hypercall to send. Um, VM funk could be interesting. Um, and that fits with the interest in an asynchronous send primitive. Um, uh, it might enable the use of Argo in wider use cases. Um, third thing is, uh, at the moment, when there's, a, when there's a notification of space available in an Argo ring, it basically notifies anybody who's ever said, I like this ring, I'd like to know when I can send something to it. Uh, so it's a broadcast. Uh, or There may be excessive wake-ups given that possibly only one of the people that you're waking up will be able to uh, consume that space. So some research to do there. Um, and then the last thing is uh, integration with memory encryption technologies. Uh, this shouldn't be terribly difficult, given it's the hypervisor that uh, you're asking to uh, perform the, the data copies. But um, we'll see. When, when Zen gets uh, memory encryption integrated, it would be interesting to see whether there's anything that needs to be done to make this work with that. Um, I'd like to, uh, I've got a few references to uh, further places where you can find out more about this. But this one's number one on the list and strongly recommended. It was uh, a presentation delivered at the Platform Security Summit uh, last year by Ian Pratt, the uh, founder of the Zen Project and the CTO of Bromium. And it's uh, a, a retrospective of the lessons learned about hypervisor security um, over the iterations uh, beginning with Zen uh, going all the way through to uh, Bromium's uh, latest tiny hypervisor with a specific focus on security. So um, please do take the time to, to watch that video. And uh, yeah, I've uh, included on my final slide a whole bunch of clickable links for everything I can think of that uh, is referencing this. Um, places to go for the code, places in OpenXT where we use it, documentation, uh, UseN's uh, v for v implementation, uh, the uh, OpenXT source code repository for that. Um, I think that's me at the end of my presentation. I don't know how much time I have remaining. So we're heading over, but okay. coffee break right now.
Okay. Sorry, there's a mic. I'm. Uh, yeah, or, or AMD's equivalent. Um, yeah, I have not. There are other experts on, on that. Uh, so I see potential integrity benefits from this for dealing with like uh, potentially not memory corruption safe people at the other side of the ring. Um, but from the confidentiality from the confidentiality perspective, um, this seems like kind of um, exercise in I, I, um, there's lots of cooperative side channels through speculative execution and a lot of like just architectural things which aren't going away anytime soon. So, mm -hmm. is the goal of this to what, what is the confidentiality model that you're assuming on the hardware that you're running? Is like what is the goal just to limit bandwidth of? Um, no, no, it's it's um, it, it's to enf the ability to enforce access control over when you establish a connection between VMs, basically a yes or no, and to enable uh, one end of a connection to have the ability to reason about who's on the other end with with the, the connection information described by an entity that it trusts, right? So um, the hypervisor is. Uh, a better place to put your trust than the random person on the other end of some shared memory. But with grant tables, you also grant with some explicit domain ID, so you have that information, right? You, you do, um, but I mean, for the grant tables, for example, you could have the domain reincarnated with the same uh, domain identifier. Um, whereas, you know, this, your ring will be torn down if the other end of the endpoint is different. Uh, I was about to ask that, because when you send, do you just send it to a domain? Like, uh, you do. Well, actually, in, in the current implementation of Argo, yes, there's um, a, the, the, the vCentry Bromium implementation of V for V has a, a very simple name service, actually. You can specify a UUID, um, which can map to the control domain, uh, or it can map to my subdomain right now, right? And that's where the data will get sent. So it, there's no opportunity for um, looking up your domain ID, things changing, and then you using that domain ID and it goes somewhere you didn't want it to. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's like the browser. Right. Um, you'll never get a notification. So what happens is that hypervisor state gets torn down. When the ring goes away, all of the pending notifications go away too. Um, I don't think there is a notification you'd have to find about via some other means that your input is gone. So when, yeah, well if you if you try to send to that ring, you're going to get you're going to get an error. So basically, if, if if the client ever you know issues a, a notify call, um, it, it, it's going to get back a no. That's not there anymore. Um, yeah.
sure. Yeah. The, the other one uh, is uh, do you know the Lambdaman copies perform weekly to the time inside an account that it takes? Um, it's the sender. The, the time is accounted to the sender because it's a synchronous uh, operation. So the hypercall. The sender issues the hypercall, the, the synchronous copy that happens then, that's the mem copy. Um, so yeah, it's going to be counted to the sender. Um, so if, for example, you provide um, uh, memory that the hypervisor isn't going to be able to read. Um, yeah, it, 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 let's say that you give it a, a large buffer and only the start of that buffer is actually valid. Um, it's going to find out halfway through that you've given it some rubbish. Um, and so you'll get a, I, I'm pretty sure you'll get a hypervisor log message that the guest is, the sending guest is doing stuff it's not really supposed to. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the the operation call will fail. That yeah, that that didn't happen. Yeah. Okay. Um, is there anything that's tie specific to x86, or is this pretty generic enough for ARM? I, it's implemented in ARM too. Okay. okay. Yeah, so, so this is the VVV tables which OpenXD carries that's not in Zen. And one of the reasons it's not in Zen is because it, it's a good fit for the OpenXD use case because um, we're pretty locked down. We, we only use, uh, our, so all of our use cases are between platform VMs. Um, and so we, we, you know, we've got more confidence in those than the, than the running guests. And yeah, you do. In the, in the VVV tables, you specify um, the, the, this, source and destination can talk to this other source and destination. You basically, the domain ID and port per hair. Um, the, the, one of the challenges with it is with the wildcard rings where, right, all of a sudden if you want, if, it's fine for sending it to the wildcard ring, but in order to be able to reply, you've got to open up that firewall um, for anybody who can send to it if you want to generally allow a service to be accessible by any VM, which is not the case where we're using it. Sorry. Uh, but can you also force to tear down existing connections at runtime from spoon stack or spoon zero or whatever? Um, you could, uh, no, it won't force it to be torn down, but you can add a rule which basically says this, this connection's uh, not allowed anymore, at which point any send operations are going to hit that firewall rule. So in effect, you, you accomplish the same thing. The ring's still registered, but there's no data going. Um, if you don't want it to. Um, okay, what is the performance impact in practice? Uh, how many copies are there when you are talking, measuring it from one user space to another user space? Um, I think there's just the one. There. Uh, I'm less, f honestly, I, I'm less familiar with the Linux driver implementation than I am with the hypervisor implementation. Um, Eric is a uh, chap who works on OpenXD who's working on the uh, Linux driver. We're in the middle of um, writing a new one to uh, use the VSOC interface uh, rather than the existing character implementation that we have. Uh, we've got one that works for now. We would quite like this, this VSOC one. I don't know whether Linux is doing copies inside the kernel. Uh, I, I don't necessarily see why it would need to, um, but there's definitely the hypervisor doing a copy from the source to the destination. So do you have some benchmarks or for, for this? <laughs> no, I don't. Okay.